Welcome to Unit 6. At this point, we return to the theme of spiritual art and spiritual spaces, and now we're focusing on early Christianity. We dashed headlong through the last days of the Roman Empire, and I think for all of us, a certain classical era exhaustion had set in. So I'd like to begin this unit by backtracking a little to the late Roman Empire. The third century, the 200s, were grim times for the Roman Empire. Civil war raged during much of this period. The Persians in the east and the Germanic tribes in the west threatened the frontiers. The old senatorial elite had lost power and influence as Rome was increasingly ruled by tough soldier emperors from the provinces. Interestingly, and in part because they had much more humble origins, these new emperors intensified the cult of the emperor as a god, and they sought to reinforce public worship of the old gods and the new emperor gods. But the emperors also recognized that they had an increasingly diverse citizenry, and they tolerated any number of religions, especially Eastern mystery religions. Remember that sign of Mithras? Uh, they even had a special ceremony for incorporating the gods of defeated tribes into the Roman pantheon, essentially celebrating these gods' defection over to Rome. Even monotheistic Judaism allowed re enjoyed religious toleration because the Jews were willing to offer prayers for, though not to, the emperor and the temple. The attacks on Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple were punishment for political revolt, not for religious unconformity. But this new sect, the Christians, puzzled and disturbed the soldier emperors. The Christians did not revolt. They claimed to be good citizens of the empire. They paid their taxes and they stayed out of trouble, but they refused to participate in sacrifices to the emperor. And as the rule of emperors became more tenuous, those sacrifices seemed even more critical to preserving Roman power. The emperor actually enjoyed something of a revival under Emperor Diocletian at the end of the 4th century. He was the emperor who established a tetrarchy with two rulers in the east and two in the west, which is shown in this famous statue, which the 4th Crusaders stole from Constantinople and installed in St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. It was a longtime uh, AP favorite, but it isn't on the current list. At any rate, Diocletian also persecuted Christians, often quite ferociously. Civil war broke out among the Tetrarchs when Diocletian retired in 305. The winner was Constantine, who was son of one of the Tetrarchs. Before his final battle at Milvian Bridge, Constantine had a dream or a vision in which he saw the Cairo, a symbol that combines the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek. Constantine had his soldiers place this mark on their shields and he won the battle and the empire. So here you see a carved Cairo from around 350 or a generation after the Battle of Milvian Bridge. On the bottom, you see two Roman soldiers, and the carving also includes victory wreaths commemorating this, bat commemorating this battle. But neither Constantine nor the empire immediately and fully embraced Christianity. The soldier emperors had often claimed that individual gods intervened to give them victory. And at first, those Kairos carried at the Battle of Milvian Bridge seemed like one more example of one more god weighing in on the victor's side. The Arch of Constantine, shown here, is covered with recycled images from Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius statues, widely acknowledged to be great emperors, and include images of Hadrian offering sacrifices to the gods. It does not include any Christian symbols. By the way, Ms. Jacobs and I optimistically included the Arch of Constantine as one of our required works, but I'm going to talk about it only very quickly. So many College Board required works and so little time. Uh, but as I said, Constantine collected relief sculptures from monuments to his favorite emperors, the good emperors, and reworked them in his art, more spolia. Note the classical composition of these figures in the reworked circles within the circles. Uh, but here we see the less naturalistic late Roman style. Uh, we see Constantine hanging out with Hadrian and Marcus Aurelius. A little ahistorical there. The most important non-recycled part of the arch is a frieze depicting Constantine's victory. As I just mentioned, it does not include Christian symbols. The new emperor did not want to anger the Romans or undermine the veneration of the emperor, but he had begun to learn more about the monotheistic nature of Christianity, so he also did not name any of the traditional Roman gods on his arch. 
Whatever his religious convictions at the time of his triumph, Constantine sought out Christian scholars and chose to be baptized just before his death. By the way, last-minute baptism was common in the early church. People often chose to be baptized on their beds, deathbeds when presumably they wouldn't have a lot more opportunity to fall into sin. At any rate, in 313, Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity. Note, it wasn't yet the state religion. And both in Rome and in his new capital of Constantinople, Constantine sponsored the erection of new Christian churches, much larger and much more ornately decorated than any that had been seen before. Before this, churches had been small, Christians had had to often meet in secret. Now, I'm going to talk about these great architectural works very soon, but first we need to backtrack a little and look at Christian art in the days before Constantine made Christianity respectable and his successors made it the official religion of the empire. So most of the early Christian art that we have comes from catacombs. This is the very early Christian art, or tunnels and rooms covered, carved into the limestone tufa beneath the city. These are really, by the way, cool to explore, and they give you a tremendous sense of the secretive, embattled status of the early church, so you all should put it on the list. Uh, the picture on the right gives you a sense of how the catacombs look today, although electric lighting does take something away from the experience. This is not a required work, which is the catacombs of Priscilla, but it's quite similar, and I've kept the slide because it contains so many useful vocabulary words, and so that I would not have to rework all those circles and arrows. You saw these terms in the Khan Academy video, or at least so I hope. I'm going to say, oops, I get confused when I have these built slides. Okay, I'm going to say relatively little about this required work since it was so well explained in the Khan Academy video, uh, including why I label this so-called. But let me repeat a point I've made before and one that's especially important for this unit. You're going to be looking at a few works, specifically a few great church churches in depth. And we're going to rely heavily on homework to cover the other works. If you skip homework and the College Board decides to use one of those images for, say, seven or eight image-based questions, you could find yourself seriously messed up. Your choice, but you know what Ms. Jacobs and I would recommend. Note that what looks like architectural features along the wall is actually a painted surface. So where have we seen this before? This is first-style Roman painting, and we saw it in Pompeii. I wouldn't put it past the College Board to draw just that comparison. So what does this painting show? Well, the woman being it, who was in the casket, the sarcophagus in this space, the dead woman, uh, we see in three stages of life. She's getting married on the left, she's having children and raising them on the right, and in the middle she's praying. That is the orontopos with hands raised. We see that in the center. Not the modeling of her face. This is much more three-dimensional than much of the Byzantine painting we'll be seeing soon. As the Khan Academy video noted, you see shadowing, in particular under her chin. So the Roman painting tradition is still alive and well at this point. Do you remember the man and, life, uh, man and wife from Pompeii? What similarities do you see? What symbols do you see in the pendentives? Those are those somewhat triangular corners below the shallow domes. Doves, of course, are a symbol of peace on the Holy Spirit. Peacocks are a symbol of eternal life. This photo doesn't capture the quail, which you see in the Khan Academy podcast, but they represent earthbound life. Here we see one of the most common themes in early Christian art, Christ as the Good Shepherd. The early images of Christ almost always show him as a beardless young man. They also show him teaching his disciples, much as Socrates and other classical era teachers discussed philosophy in the Agora or Calm. So why would Christ be portrayed that way? Well, partly this was a way of portraying leaders and thinkers that the Roman people would have understood. Uh, here's a famous Good Shepherd mosaic from the Western Roman capital of Ravenna, and a work that I'm not going to teach you, but I think you should put on the list. One of my favorites. So I got confused by this myself at first, but the Khan Academy video actually discusses a different Good Shepherd fresco from the Catacombs of Priscilla than the one that's a required image that I just showed you. Remember, this was a huge complex. I'm just assuming that Good Shepherd scenes were popular and abounded. 
So here's the College Board required ceiling fresco on the left. In the version, we once again see Christ the Good Shepherd in a roundel, surrounded by prefiguring scenes from the Old Testament in lunettes or half circles. Now, I have to make a confession. I tried and failed to find close-up photos that I was sure were from this particular fresco. Uh, but I think that these are the Old Testament scenes that are shown. I'm basing this on another teacher's slideshow. Again, I, I worked hard on this, but had limited success. So there's Adam and Eve. Remember that Christ is the new Adam, free from sin. There's Jonah sitting under that rubber tree, cursing Nineveh. Again, Jonah was buried for three days in a fish and returned to live. Moses striking the rock to get water for his people. Like Jesus, Moses freed his people from captivity. The ever-popular Abraham preparing to sacrifice Isaac as Jesus sacrificed himself for humankind. And I'm just hoping that's enough information on this uh, very hard to see image. Given the bad condition of the images, I doubt you'd be asked to identify something that's almost impossible to make out. So basically what I think you need to know is that the Good Shepherd was a central image and that pre scenes from the Old Testament, stories from the Old Testament that prefigured Jesus were very popular in early Christian art. Okay, it's fasten your seatbelts time. We are now entering the period in this course where you will start to collect a scary portfolio of churches and to download a load of architectural terminology. You're forewarned, right? So let's get started by reviewing the basic Roman Basilica, which was the basis for many of the imposing churches built in the reign of Constantine and his immediate successors and really has affected, has influenced church architecture up to this day. So you've seen this slide before. What is it? This is a reconstruction of the Basilica Ulpia from Trajan's Forum, which was not a church, of course, but a public administration building. So why did the now imperially approved Christian church adopt a basilica plan? Well, they needed a space that would hold a lot of people. They also wanted to convey the imperial approval for their new religion, and using a famous imperial-style building helped send that message. And then there's a practical reason. They needed a longitudinal plan, something rectangular that led up to an altar. The basilica's long nave and apse served well. The Khan Academy video uh, on Santa Sabina mentioned Old St. Peter's. So here's a floor plan of the long since demolished church. It's been replaced by the Baroque St. Peter's in Rome. Uh, it has some very helpful labels, which is why I've kept it. Note one very important departure from the Roman Basilica. Worshippers entered through the narthex on the short end of the rectangle. That led their eyes immediately toward the altar, which was the focal point of worship. Another innovation was a transept or a hall perpendicular to the main hall or nave. As we'll see in a minute, your required early Basilican church, Santa Sabina, did not have a transept, but the other churches we'll study mostly will. Old St. Peter's is the first known building with a transept, but they would become common elements in Christian churches, not least because they transformed a basic rectangular rectangle into a building shaped like a cross. Old St. Peter's, by the way, was designed to hold three to 4,000 worshipers, a far cry from the house churches where early Christians had secretly worshipped. The nave alone was as long as an American football field. So this is a required work, and I hope and trust you watched the excellent Khan Academy video on this church because I'm going fast. Quick review. What kind of columns do you see? They're Corinthian. Note those acanthus leaves. They were taken from older Roman buildings, and the term for that architectural recycling, you've seen this before, is spolia. In fact, where have you seen uh, taking Roman columns before? The Mosque of Cordoba. So what basilican features do you see here? There's the high, flat timber roof, side aisles with a lower roof. You can see them sticking out in the photo of the exterior, and a rounded apse at one end. So here's the Santa Sabina floor plan, which is a required image. The round building to the left housed a baptistry, uh, but the side buildings don't really constitute a transept. So what are the names that go with A, B, and C? Nave, aisle, and apse. The entranceway is more of an atrium than a true narthex. As I said, the Basilican church plan is still developing. 
So this isn't a required image, but the carved doors of Santa Sabina are some of the oldest surviving works of Christian art, and the panel on the upper left, which I've enlarged, is probably the earliest depiction of the crucifixion, at least that survived. The art in the catacombs, understandably, perhaps because they're tombs, tended to focus on resurrection rather than crucifixion. Note that the doors are carved with stories, narratives, although I realize it's hard to read those labels on this slide. From the very beginning, churches used art to tell biblical narratives, and this became even more important as we move into the early Middle Ages and literacy rates drop dramatically. At this point, people could still mostly read. In 330, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire east to the town of Byzantium. He had a lot of reasons for making this move. He wanted to make a fresh start for his Christian empire, and Rome was filled with monuments to pagans. But the move also reflected some geopolitical realities. The West was increasingly under siege from Germanic tribes. The East was under siege from the Persians, but Constantinople was more easily defended, especially by navy. The East was richer than the West, so it was more important to defend. And let's face it, Constantine did not suffer from a deflated ego. He liked having a capital named after himself. Constantine died seven years later in 337. I am not going to try to describe the succession crisis that followed. Lots of mayhem, lots of fratricide. The next really important emperor from our standpoint is Theodosius, who ruled from 378 to 395. He was the last emperor to rule an undivided empire. It was Theodosius who declared Christianity to be the empire's only legal religion. He helped settle a bunch of theological disputes within the church, and he destroyed many pagan temples, holy sites, and images. He even disbanded the Olympic Games, which seems kind of mean-spirited. Uh, Theodosius divided the empire between his sons Honorius in the west and Arcadius in the east. It was Honorius who moved the capital of the Western Roman Empire to Ravenna. Since it was surrounded on all sides, either by the sea or by swamps, Ravenna was simply easier to defend from the many Gothic and German invaders than Rome was. It was also closer to the eastern capital of Constantinople, which is frankly where the action was now. We're going to come back to Ravenna in a moment, but first, let's look at a little Byzantine history. Actually, the dividing line between late antiquity and the Byzantine Empire isn't as clear as these labels make it seem. Constantine established the new Roman capital of Byzantium, renaming it Constantinople. Theodosius, while he also ruled over a still undivided Roman Empire, governed from Constantinople and imposed Christianity on an empire that was probably still predominantly pagan. All historians would call Justinian a Byzantine empire emperor, but he was also the last Roman emperor to speak Latin instead of Greek as his first language. And he drove his empire close to bankruptcy with military campaigns aimed at winning back Western territory, North Africa from the Vandals and Italy from the Ostrogoths. Uh, he had a lot of successes and they didn't last. The two great Byzantine churches we will look at, one today, one tomorrow, were both commissioned by Justinian. He and his empress Theodora, who are shown here in the mosaics from San Vitale and Ravenna, part of your required works, uh, were rather a piece of work. So let's watch two clips from a video about the Byzantine Empire. The first gives you a little background on these two rulers, and the second starts off just after a major riot against Justinian's rule, mostly sparked by the very high taxes he imposed to pay for all of his military adventures and for his very ambitious building program, which we'll be studying. Justinian, by the way, wanted to cut and run. Theodora, former circus performer, prostitute, and all-around tough broad, had, as we shall see, other ideas. So the video leaves off with an introduction to Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia. It's actually pronounced both ways. I tend to use what I think is the old Greek pronunciation. We'll spend almost all of next class on this incredibly important church, which we've already encountered in our Islamic art unit as the inspiration and goad to what famous architect? Sinan, Suleiman, the Magnificence Architect. At any rate, you're going to get to hear a different disembodied voice talk about this church and about two other major churches from this unit. Enjoy the break, but miss me, okay? By the way, this video continues with an excellent and quite different analysis of Hagia Sophia, which focuses more sharply on its engineering. It's up on Moodle, and as always, I'd encourage you to watch. So we're going to end this class by looking at Justinian's second 
most famous church, San Vitale in Ravenna. I did not assign this Khan Academy video because I wanted you to watch it and to discuss it in class. You're going to read about both of these churches in your next homework assignment, and there will be quiz questions from this video as well on the reading in your next quiz. As this slide notes, I want you to pay attention to a few elements of this work. Pay, pay special attention, I should say. What was Justinian's purpose in building the church in Ravenna? What is the difference between a central and a basilican plan? You have a lot of church floor plans in your future. In fact, your semester final is going to include a rather brutal sacred space floor plan matching question that I'll put up on Moodle around Thanksgiving, so you'll have plenty of time to practice. How are the portrayals of Christ in art evolving? Remember that youthful good shepherd we just saw. Increasingly, you'll see images of Christ that become older, more focused on power and omnipotence, Christ as ruler of the world, what's called Christ pancrator in the Greek tradition, as opposed to Christ the teacher, the shepherd, the miracle worker. Notice how imagery combines religious messages with some very strong messages about power and authority. Note the changing stylistic conventions, especially see that we're moving further away from naturalism of the classical world to stylized figures that follow conventions uh, that have more to do with concepts than with descriptive reality. And finally, pay attention to mosaic terms and techniques. In your next class, on to Sophia.